Hello everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, like with Jack Brains and Trish and everyone else. So uh, yeah, so as Trish was saying, uh, this talk is about software modernization, but more on the strategy aspect of it. Uh, so to give you some background, uh, as Trish was saying, we I was involved in the, the, the Java community in London and the later on stuff in the craftsmanship community. As you all know, the software craftsmanship movement is, is highly focused on uh, technical practices and code quality and things like that. And it was a natural step for us to, after we started our company, to start being involved in, now we call them software modernization projects, but like what happened with most people when they joined the craftsmanship uh, community or they heard about extreme programming or all those code qualities, uh, those uh, practices uh, related to, to code quality, people get excited about it. They want to do those things, right? So, but in reality, uh, most of us work in environments where uh, we have very large systems that were built before we arrived. We joined and made them worse quite often. <laughs> so, uh, but, but many, thing, many times you'd like to say, we, we, we think like, I wish my systems were better or my architecture was better or we worked with a better technology. Uh, and, and over the years, uh, we were able to bring those practices into those systems and, and we ended up specializing ourselves almost like uh, by accident really because people wanted those practices and, and that uh, more agile and software craftsmanship way of working in their organization. So, and then we decided to start, so well, uh, software modernization is a thing, right? So, uh, so the reason I put this talk is going back in my experience and, and how frustrated I was for so many years in so many different companies, when I, I was seeing the technical debt, I was seeing the inefficiencies, but I was failing to actually drive the change, to actually convince uh, people to do the same thing, uh, to, to improve things. Um, and, and, and I realized that I, I'm, I'm far from being alone uh, in, in this. So, so this is the reason for the, this talk, is to help people, uh, like being developers, being architects, product owners, uh, engineering managers, any software professional, uh, infrastructure engineers, testers, anyone that is in a software project find those inefficiencies and would like to drive the change and would like to modernize their, their stack. Right, so I think that the first thing we need to, to define is what software modernization is, right? So for me, uh, software modernization is the continuous process of improving strategic systems in order to increase business agility, right? So what do I mean by this? This is not just about some small tactical work. For example, uh, small refactorings that we need to do, retrofit a few tests or write a few tests or speed up our delivery, pi uh, our build pipeline. Those are general maintenance that needs to be done always. Right, so um, this is part of any project. A modernization, when we say software modernization, is something beyond than that. It's a little bit more strategic. Of course, that it will have elements of refactoring, of improving tests, of fixing build pipelines and stuff. But normally, when we say software modernization, only something a little bit more strategic. Another thing is uh, that we realized uh, a while back. This is not something that you start and finish. The same way that you do the regular maintenance of your code, uh, you also work on more strategic things continuously. The difference is that you uh, sometimes put more emphasis or more intensity in your modernization areas, but you should never stop, right? Any company that is continuously evolving uh, and uh, relying on strategic systems, this is also important, uh, so those systems, they need to, not only those small refactorings, but they also need to be strategically modernized over time. So that's, what, that's how I define software modernization, something a little bit wider than the general maintenance. Uh, so the first question is, why do we fail to make a case for it? So again, looking back, like I could see inefficiencies, but I was not the only one. Uh, other developers could see, other product owners or managers or testers, uh, business, everyone in the organization could see inefficiencies. And, 
And, and I was there, if we all saw this, why did we fail uh, to make the case or to convince people? I'll talk more from a developer's perspective because it's easier for me because that's where I come from. Uh, so I think that one of the reasons that we fail is that in our head, we analyze the, the, the context, the environment, we identify what we judge to be problems, right? It's important that what we judge to be problems. Then we identify possible uh, causes. Uh, sometimes you don't even think about causes, you just find a problem, and then we give a solution to it in our head. And then what we do? We go to our managers and say, we need to do microservices. Uh, we need to do TDD. We need to go to AWS. So, and that's when things go downhill, right? So we go to, to people with a solution, right? So we fail to agree on the problem first. And this is not just especially uh, 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 specific for us developers. Even like, for example, product managers uh, or engineering directors or things like that, people uh, in different positions, uh, product owners, they also fail to make a case, to understand like, okay, I understand this, but like, I know that this is a problem. Uh, I know that we could fix this this way, but why is no one seeing? So, I believe that the disconnection is, we see the world from a perspective. And we normally are trying to drive changes or convince people that see the world in a different perspective. And, and at the end of the day, uh, it took me uh, quite a few years to realize that uh, as soon as I start having more, how can I say, I wouldn't say management pro, um, roles, but like more autonomy, more, more not autonomy, more, um, how can I say, I was taking care of things, more responsibilities, more accountability for bigger areas or projects. And, and that became that, uh, even more apparent when I started my own company with MASH. So for example, when you are running a department or a company or, or, or a team or an initiative, you don't worry just about the, some technical inefficiencies. You worry about your budget. You worry about uh, a strategy, a strategic decision that you need to make. So for example, uh, when we change a piece of, piece of code and you write our test, we have a very quick feedback loop. If I work on sprints, we have a very quick feedback loop of the stories that we built or not. But when we are driving a business initiative or, or a modernization initiative in this case, those are much more longer term. The investment is bigger. The feedback loop is longer, right? So you don't migrate uh, uh, the architecture or change your technology stack. And you see, first of all, you don't do that quickly and you don't see the, the return, an immediate return, which means that the driving those chains uh, for the people that needs to sponsor that, it's quite scary. So we need to understand this, right? We need to understand those, those uh, what is the business value? Because we are asking a lot. We say like, hey, we need to stop those teams or change a lot of things. And it will cost a significant amount of money. It will take a lot of significant amount of time, probably a significant amount of effort from people. Uh, so, in, and we cannot just say, because, and, and the reason that why I want these investments is because I want to do microservices, right? Or because I want to use AWS, right? So this is what, the, the, this is what I want to convey in this talk, is, is to, to share with you or give you ammunition uh, for you to start driving those changes, right? So the first thing you need to do is business drivers, right? You understand the technology, you understand, but how do they relate to the business, business drivers? So what those changes that you are proposing would affect in terms of the business or better if it was the other way around, what are the business inefficiencies that you could fix improving the technology or modernizing the technology or your systems? So this is by far no, no exhaustive list, but most of the business drivers for modernization, they fit in some of those categories or very related categories. I'll try to go into them so, so you understand when you're making your case, what those things mean. So let's take sustainable change first, right? So the business can move only as fast as we can deliver quality software. That's normally uh, how I say that, right? So 
if you are trying to modernize, to create a, a software modernization initiative, what are you trying to achieve? What is the driver for the business? A very, very common one is called sustainable change. We see a lot of inefficiencies. The teams are not working, working uh, well together or they are struggling to deliver fast. We're struggling to release or there is a, uh, the cost of building something or taking something is too high. So we want you to fix all of that so we have a sustainable change, right? So that is easy to keep adding features or changing features or changing software uh, and pushing to production. So we have this nice cadence that you like in Agile is there is a business initiative, the, a team takes that business initiative and gradually uh, start uh, working on it or incrementally working on it and pushing to production with not a lot of friction. So this is what we call sustainable change. Right, so this is one driver that you can use uh, for your um, organization. Another one, a lot of companies want to innovate, and quite a few of them, they lost the ability to innovate, or innovation comes at a, a high cost. So when you talk about innovation, uh, for example, some businesses, they want to do experiments. And say, so like, if we had this feature, would our, would our customers like? Or if we try to do this approach, would we have some savings? So what if we change the technology and put some machine learning, would we improve our processes or be smarter in our decisions and stuff? So all of those kinds of innovations, it's very difficult to innovate if your architecture, if your systems are not uh, arranged in a way to enable that innovation. So for example, if you want to do A-B testing and, and all those things like feature flags or, or having things in parallel, your system needs to be designed for that. Like your architecture needs to enable you to do that uh, easily without impacting the rest of the system. So you can isolate the areas that you want to innovate and not cause a big impact on the rest. So another area, leverage te technology. Some companies are spending a huge amount of money and effort with number of people uh, for example, just to look after their production environments or their testing areas or uh, so, so things like that. So, for example, uh, releasing a feature is costly. So backups and monitoring. So they could use the technology uh, to reduce cost, right? So or they have systems, a very common one that we, we face in, in their ecosystem. They have a lot of different systems, but they have some of them that are quite old they were proprietary, or they are very tight to a vendor, and they struggle to, 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 to move forward because they are always uh, constrained by those systems. So that's another reason uh, to start uh, modernizing. So business alignment is very interesting because you know like the, the Conway's law, right? So that the, 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 your systems tend to have the same design of the communication. Uh, I'm just part of it, uh, uh, just uh, saying with my own words, right? So the communication structure of the organization tends to reflect in how your systems communicate and are designed. Uh, so the problem is quite often there is a mismatch in how the systems are designed. Over time, the organization, organization is changing and the systems are designed in a way that doesn't in support the individual business areas. So when there are innovations within a business area, you end up impacting a lot of other things because the systems are all intertwined, right? So it's very difficult to isolate a business flow that goes across different areas because the systems don't allow, they were not designed to be like that. So re-architecting your systems in order to uh, align them to how the business is structured uh, also uh, has a lot of uh, advantages to, to the business, right? So one that is uh, not many people talk about, but we are encountering that a lot in the past years. Companies come to us and say, hey, we are struggling to hire talent or struggling to retain talent or keep our people excited. Or So modernizing also has that effect. So if you have a technology stack that is too old, it's not only about being a no technology stack, but it's if it's difficult to work with your systems, so everything is clunky, so the process is frustrating, uh, and then on top of that, the technology is old and, and everything is manual and, and stuff, the chances for you to attract talent to your company is very small. And, and, and the ones that are there, at some point, 
they if things don't change, they will need to they want to leave. So that's another for me. This is an important factor because for any company that rely on software uh, as part of their strategy, the people building and maintaining that software is also part of the strategy. So they need to, to care about that. So that's another reason uh, to modernize. And the reason that are a very this is a very common reason we work with a lot of very large organizations in uh, regulated environments. So risk management is a big thing. Right, so if you are compliant, so how can you architect your systems in a way that you can evolve them, but you still remain compliant to regulations or keep regulations at a bay. So in a way that you are compliant, but, but you don't need to worry about being compliant while we're changing most of your systems. So security, scalability, issues that can have in production, monitoring, all of those things are about risk management, right? So those are also reasons for us to modernize. So what I'm trying to do here is just to explain to you. So if you are, if you want to drive technical change, you need to go way beyond the technology side. You need to understand the business features because otherwise you have no chance to drive anything, right? So this is one part of the foundation. Then what we need, uh, what we need to understand is, okay, we understand what, how better the, the business would be, but what are the common impediments? Why we, even if you understand that, what are the, what is impeding us to do those things? And that can be a variety of things. Lack of time, lack of money, lack of skills, uh, people that, uh, uh, for example, fear to increase risk. Maybe they have a very complex, del delicate uh, system, tons of people using high throughput and stuff. So changing that may really cause a big risk. So there are many, many different types of, uh, impediments, and you need to understand what they are and then try to mitigate them. Even when you say lack of time and lack of money, because you are proposing something more strategic, this is very relative. They might be really short of time and money, but also they might not even understand how much time and money they are spending or how much waste they have in their system or how much time and money they are spending on activities that they probably should not need to spend. So that's an interesting conversation to have, right? So when, when you talk about time and money, so we, there is an investment, but what we'll be saving in the future, right? So, um, and then once we understand common business drivers and common, imped common impediments, one thing that we need to be very clear is about the principles of modernizations. This is, again, I'm still working on, on those things, but, uh, it's in, there is a lot of misconceptions in when you throw a term like agile, craftsmanship, uh, DevOps, uh, modernization, people immediately build some assumptions in their head. So it is, it is, it's very important that we mitigate, that we explain what are the principles behind it so we remove the fear. So for example, um, for me, one of the principles in modernization, we should have a big vision. We should, a modernization project should excite people. So wow. This is how the world could look like. If you change all of this, look how amazing that would be, right? But we should work in small increments. Because if we try to sell, oh, we, we are here and we need to go to this big thing, this God knows it can take years to get there and you may never go there. So it's good to excite, to have that vision, that direction, but make sure that we work in small increments towards a direction. And then we keep recalibrating that direction, that vision, right? Valuable driven, uh, value driven increments, make sure that every increment brings some value because if you don't work in a, in, in a, in this way, you will undermine the entire project. If you start working on the modernization initiative and the, the sponsors, the, the, the stakeholders feel that you are not adding value, they say, Oh, let's stop it. So make sure that the whole point of this is business value and not just play with technology. Minimal business disruption is, a, uh, is important to talk about because this is a major concern. It, it's impossible to say that there will be no disruption because they will need to invest time, money, people on that. So there is a disruption, but we, it's important that we don't disrupt important streams of work from the business. There are priorities, there are things that they need to get done. Uh, so we need to work in a way to minimize as much as possible the, the, the business uh, activities while modernizing. Uh, 
excellence within pragmatic solutions. This is, it, it would be awesome if you could change everything. That's not, not, not gonna happen and it's probably not worth it either. So normally what, what I suggest is try to be, to have, keep your feet on the ground and be realistic about what can be done and what cannot be done. So don't be a dreamer and, right? So, so like, okay, given our constraints, it would be awesome if you had all of that, but being very pragmatic, what, what could we really do here to achieve something? Define a, a, a pragmatic solution, and within the pragmatic solution, you need to have excellence, and not the other way around. Because excellence, when we are chasing excellence in a non-bounded uh, effort, we change to, do, to, to waste a lot of time. We are just playing with stuff, uh, and, and, and we lose track or sight of business value, right? Another very important thing that people are always scared, and this should be a principle, is if you end broke, don't fix it. There's no point in refactoring or to re-architect systems that are not broken. If they are not in the critical path of the business, they are not uh, the, the, the critical path of the business right now, and they will not be in the near future. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever to modernize those systems, right? Maybe a few tactical solutions, putting some APIs on top in whichever way you can would already be good enough and let those systems be. And then there is the law of diminishing returns is at some point we need to stop. It's, it's almost like uh, if, you, if you just had like, a, imagine a very large method or class or group of classes and you keep refactoring, refactoring, refactoring at no end. You can keep doing that forever. It will never be perfect. So, but after a point, you have less, the, the, that's the law of diminishing returns, you have less return on that investment. So a modernization is the same. It's kind of the Pareto's law. You, you try to apply 20% of effort to get 80% of return, but it's not worth trying to get 100% of return or 100% improvement, because that's where you spend most of your time in the last 20%. So, so those are the principles. This is what I call the foundation, right? So the foundation, foundational knowledge that you need to have before you even consider a, a, a modernization initiative or to drive that. So understanding the business drivers, common impediments, the principles, with that foundation in mind, now we are start getting ready to start to, to be more strategic. Okay, now, now I want to drive our initiative. What do I need to do, right? So this is very similar to, to those, those five uh, kind of steps is very similar to what we do with our new clients in modernization uh, initiatives, right? So those are kind of the, the, the steps that we follow to understand what needs to be done, right? So this is, again, this is not the actual modernization work, is creating that uh, strategic approach that everyone was on board so that we can actually do the work. The first thing is that let's do not discuss solutions before agreeing on the problems, right? So this is key. You will hold your any solution to the last responsible minute, right? So another thing that you need to understand is you need to run some workshops with a very diverse set of people. You need to have your business representatives, your QA, your infrastructure engineers, your software engineers, your architects, or whoever else, or your marketing. Each project, each company will have different types of stakeholders that should be part of it. But any relevant stakeholder should be in these uh, discussions. Uh, because each one of them will see problems in, in a completely different way or have completely different needs. That's why you need them. So let's go down into some of those things. So the first two, the first two business alignment and technical alignment are the hardest one. That's where you really need everyone to be on board. And that's where you build the common understanding. So there are many, there are different ways uh, for you to, to achieve this business alignment, right? Different uh, perspectives that you can take. But the most important thing is you need to start focusing your initiative. Large companies have tons of systems, tons of problems, right? The first advice is, you know, bring all those people. Guys, we cannot change the whole thing. Let's focus on the areas that are more important. So, so then you choose those areas you want to focus, and in those areas you go deep. And then you, you need to decide for those areas what kind of 
focus do you want the initiative to have? And it doesn't need to have one. You can have a combination of things. So, for example, some strategic value. So maybe cost reduction, compliance with regulation, risk management. So, so things like that. Those are the strategic value if, we, if we've done that. Maybe some inefficiencies as well. So it takes too long to release or there is a low performance. Or, uh, for example, a common one is teams are... Are always stuck. They they are always depend blocked by each other and stuff. Quite often we find hot spots in the code where every team needs to change, or that is that service or those classes, or uh, that everyone is always fighting over. So removing those uh, hot spots that we call may allow the teams to work more efficiently. So there are quite a few uh, uh, takes that you, uh, approach that you can take. A, a very common one also when you are in a very large uh, and complex uh, environment. Instead of going straight to the gold, to the meat, uh, that can be, uh, 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 you, you increase the risk of failing and, and lose entire credibility. So you can agree with this group and say, look, there's a lot of risk involved in here. So let's take a smaller area that is important, but not a, the critical path. And let's run a few experiments. If you want to migrate the technology, move to the cloud, re-architect, let's take an area that is a little bit safer as a proof of concept, as an experiment. Let's work uh, for a period of time in that, create an use as an exemplar project, and then we see what we learned, and then we review the, the, the strategy. So we, once we have the focus in mind, then you start uh, the areas and the goals. Then you can start looking at uh, the main features, the pain points, desired improvements, this is a fascinating thing to do. Bring all those different people to the same room for a couple of hours and ask them, what are the main features of this system or this area? They will have very different views. The pain point is exactly the same. Ask them, what are the pain points for you? The testers have one, the developers have one, the business has one, and then the desired improvements, the same thing. This is where you start aligning those people. Is, is you start sharing. So everyone in, in the room starts seeing how other people see the problems. What, what do they care about? And, and another way of, uh, how can I say, dig more into those issues uh, that, that they have is what doing what you call value stream mapping. This is a, this is a real one we ran with, with a client. So on the left-hand side, you have an idea being generated by the business. So someone in the business had an idea. On the, the right-hand side, we have the software going to production. And this is their path to production. From idea to software in production, those are all the different steps. So this is what we call value stream mapping. In here, you can visualize all the different steps, who gets involved, when something doesn't happen as expected, how far back it goes into the process. And this is a phenomenal source of information for us to tackle in our modernization initiative. On top of that, those people in the room, like nine out of 10 times that we've done this, they have no clue that their process was so complex because each one of those people see just one part of this process and almost no one has a full visibility. So this is a fascinating thing to do. Once you understand the current uh, situation uh, of the business, so the pain points, the main features, so on and so forth, body stream mapping, before we start creating a strategy uh, for the modernization, it's like, where are they going? So we can look at their portfolio management, we can do some impact mapping, can look at their team's backlog and understand what do they have next? What, what's coming up next? What is important for them that because the, this information is very relevant because our modernization approach might either need to be out of the way of the critical path of the things that they have planned, or it can be essential, can be used to actually enable those things that they want to do moving forward. So this is why it's really important to understand all those different aspects. And then what we need to do, once we have that, uh, we need to understand what are the constraints. So are we in a regulated environment? Do, do we have SLAs with clients? Uh, so lack of skills. This also needs, we all need to be very clear of which constraints we have, right? So, and last 
we need to start looking at metrics. So if we wanted to do this initiative program, how we measure the success? And the kind of metrics will vary depending on which what we're trying to achieve, right? So it can be cost reduction, sales increase, SLAs, or compliance with regulation. And there are some more common metrics that was published in the Accelerate book. I, I strongly recommend you to read Accelerate. Uh, that's the name of the book. And they talk about those four key metrics. There's deployment frequency, lead time, mean time to restore and change failure. So this is all backed by research. You can go on and, and, and read more. Uh, but those are very good in, in indicatives or metrics that we can use almost in, well, in the vast majority of software systems. Um, so, now we have a business alignment. At this point, after those initial workshops with that group, we have at least, we should have at least a business understanding. Now we need to do the same with the technical side. We need to look at the overall architecture, the, the different components involved. We need to take some business flows and map them into the different components or services. We need to understand the dependencies in, in the uh, architecture and things like that, right? So. This needs to be done also with the business people in the same group that was part of the previous uh, phase, because most of them have absolutely no clue how our systems are organized. They have no clue how they map to the business areas, the dependencies. That's when they start seeing the complexity. Here, we are not talking about anything technical. We're not talking about uh, Java or refactoring or TDD, nothing. It's just high level. It's just the high level architecture, the mapping, the business flow mapped to technical components. So this creates, it blows their mind sometimes when they see that uh, in certain organizations. And then we do exactly the same thing, pain points, design improvements, technical constraints, and the risks, right? So I'm going to go a little bit uh, faster because I, I realize that I, I don't have a lot of time left and I still need to cover a lot of things. So. I'm just going to pop in quickly and say, we've lost the top of your head. We can't see your eyes. <laughs> Thanks, Trish. Is it better? Uh -huh. Much better. Thank you. Uh, yeah, because I have two screens and I end up bringing the link down a bit to, to look at the other screen. So, thanks. So, yeah, feel free to interrupt me if you, if, if you need. Yeah, so um, technical constraints need to be there because sometimes you want to do a lot of things, but we don't understand the technical constraints that the organization has. Being in a regulation, regulated environment will bring a lot of constraints. SLAs bring constraints. So, uh, for example, some, some uh, we have a client, they, they have like more than, uh, I think that close to 14,000 instances of their software, where 4,000 are installed on premise. So, when you are in an environment like that, they cannot be multi tenant, they need to be multi instance, each client. Each one of their clients need to have their own instance of their software. This puts an enormous constraint in what we can do in, with your architecture and technology that you can use. So this is why this is so important for us to understand before we start going to microservices. So uh, at this point, this is the, 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 the two sides, the, the business alignment, technical alignment. This is gathering data, understanding the solution, and bringing everyone on board, aligning everyone. At this point, we are ready to start creating a technical vision, right? So at this point, we should all, in that group, should have the same view, the same understanding of problems, business and technical. And now it's okay. So now, if we were to modernize this, what would be our vision? And in here, you need to Think about architecture, technology, testing, uh, modularization, team ownership. So there are tons of things that we need to factor in when you are creating a technical vision, right? So, for example, uh, all design improvements, inefficiencies, vision, where they want to go, KPIs, all of those things need to be catered in that vision. Because if you fail to address some of the key ones, of course, you will not have the sponsorship that you need to drive that change. I'm not going to dwell too much on this because this varies so much from client to client that there's not even a point to, to go a little bit deeper on this. But uh, once you have that vision, that place that you would like to be, a vision is a direction. It's not a plan. It's not a plan that you're going to follow one step at a time. It's a direction. So like, it's an angle. Imagine an angle that, so okay, it's roughly that direction that I want to go. 
then that's when the technical strategy comes in. So if we want to be there, we are here, we want to be roughly there, what should be our first step? Where do we start from? And that's when you now shorten your visibility. So, okay, let's try to work incrementally and define the next steps. There are a few big decisions that you need to make. For example, when you look at uh, Gartner, all this kind of nonsense that you see, uh, when they talk about uh, modernization, they say, oh, you can either do a rewrite or a re-platform, re-architect, refactor. I think that this is a very simplistic way of seeing things. For all those years that we've been doing this work, most of our modernization process is a hybrid. It's a bunch of those things together. We have a mix of re-architecting systems, uh, re -re rewriting bits of it, refactoring other bits, moving for pl a different platform for certain services. So it's always a mix of those things. And, and we need to understand at a very high level the advantages, disadvantages of things. So as we are taking different parts of the systems, and we are trying to come up with a with a, a strategy for them. You need to have those things in mind. Is it worth at least for this bit? Should we just refactor, reperform, reattack for that bit? And that, so you can make different decisions for different parts of the the system that you want to, to modernize. But again, I said I find that that approach very simplistic. Uh, I think that the process that we use is far more uh, in-depth. For example, when you create a strategy, we need to, be, to have very uh, clear goal in mind. For example, one strategy is we are going to take one area of the business, let's say the payment side of the business, right? The, the business might have tons of other stuff, catalog, product, billing, whatever, right? So we take one. It's like, go to the business, like, which one is the critical one? either because it's causing you a lot of problems right now, or it's going to become extremely strategic for you in the future. We take that area, and we are going to look at that area in a holistic way. Look at the entire solution. So we are going to stabilize that area or prepare that area strategically for the future. This is one approach. Another approach, you can say, uh, we can just take a few features. There are a few new features coming in. This is actually happening in one of our systems in their uh, payment, uh, oh, in, in one of our projects. Their payments uh, needed some uh, modernization, let's say. We took the new features. They wanted to add the new payment methods into their payment uh, platform. So we took the new payment methods and we built the new flow for the new payment methods with the parallel architecture, with the architecture that we would like to do to validate the, the, the approach and not to stop the business. And once we create that stable uh, path or flow for the new uh, payment method, we gradually, much slower, uh, start migrating the old one to the new platform. So uh, you can do uh, business flows. So maybe there are a business operation, for example, the way that uh, users, let's say, the way that they uh, search a product, up to the shopping cart, uh, add a promotion, so that imagine a whole business flow, and sometimes this is done in a very inefficient way, uh, either in the UI or in the back end or both quite often. So you can take that business flow and optimize all, all that, that flow. And that might uh, involve just changing a few bits of different services, but not the entire service, just a few bits that are responsible for the flow. So what I'm, what I'm saying here, there's no right or wrong, but this is a much more interesting way to look at uh, the strategy for modernization. And then there are the actual techniques and architecture that you want you to do. Are we going to use for a modul modular monolith? For example, that client that I mentioned that has multiple instances and installation on premise. We wanted the modularization, but we could not go microservices because it would make their deployment chaotic. So we went for a modular monolith. And we are very happy with that decision. Or also, like if you are changing something, uh, what do we do? We, do we refactor in place? So change what is in there and affect that directly, or we create a stronger fig, as I mentioned with the other one. So this is a different approach. Uh, we also use different approach, just changing the front end. It changes, for example, if you are modernizing systems and staying within the same technology stack, Let's say the system is all the systems are Java and you're going to stay with Java. It's very easy. You have, I mean, it's not easy, but uh, you will not have the same constraints as if you were, as we had one project like that where we were migrating a big monolith written in PHP to 
Java microservices. So the approach that you take, the impact in the business is significantly different. So, uh, and then for me, one of the key aspects of any uh, uh, modernization uh, initiative is modularization. At the end of the day, you need to break your problem to smaller problems, or if you have a lot of <laughs> smaller things, if they are not well divided, you may need to rejoin them, uh, join, rejoin some of those things. So, uh, but you need to focus in the modularization. You need to, we always say that is a bit of cliche, but you need to have loose coupled modules with high cohesive modules. Uh, so that's part of, this applies everywhere from a class all the way to services and business areas. And this modularization also has an interesting effect because if you get the modularization aligned to the, how the business is organized, the teams become modularized as well. Because what you want is at the team structure, teams that are high cohesive with a high uh, uh, frequency of communication, a high communication among the team members, but with a more well-defined communication across teams. So they can work very efficiently, independently, and with a very well-defined communication between as you would organize your system. So I already talked about that a little bit. So the modularization helps us to reduce cognitive load, localize chains, enable continuous delivery. So it's much easier to test and release your software if they are well modularized. Because most applications with a few exceptions, when we talk about continuous delivery, we are not delivering the entire platform continuously or the entire system continuously. What we are doing is we can have teams work in different areas of the system in parallel, and they are releasing their areas of the system as they finish whatever feature epics that they are working on. And that's the continuous deliveries. Continuous deliveries for different things, things that are happening in parallel. It's much easier to achieve that with the modularization. So, and modules can go from all the way from packages to a group of services, right? I'm not gonna dwell too much on this one. Uh, and the last step in all of this, so now we have the business uh, alignment, the technical alignment, a technical vision and a strategy, right? And now how are we gonna organize ourselves? How are we gonna, how many people will do what? Who is gonna do what? What approach do we take? Here comes many other things as well. We tried many different approaches in different clients in different situations. Uh, for example, some clients, we have a dedicated team for the improvement. You, you bring a highly specialized team because sometimes you are changing the technology, changing the, the, the programming language, we are re-architecting, or we, we really need to, to change the, the deployment pipeline. You need really specialized people and you need them to, do, to be fast. So you assemble a team and they will focus on creating these uh, foundation, let's say, so that the other teams can later on build on top. Not always this is feasible. Uh, so uh, the, the, sometimes it's just better to embed some people in the team. So you have some specialists, embed them in the team, and they can help with some uh, 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 modernization while the, the rest of the team is also building new features. Uh, there are different types of specialized teams as well. So there's dedicated team, specialized team. A dedicated team normally is a cross-functional team. A specialized team can be a team of infrastructure engineers, a team of uh, someone that knows our technology very well or someone on the React or whatever, right? So it can be something very specialized. Um, in, in other places, we say, you know what? Well, let's keep the same people, but we need to stop for two iterations or X number of time we just need to, to stabilize this area because it's causing us pain and then we go back to the backlog. So, so you can play with all those different formats, but for that you need to know what you are trying to do. And then you can arrange your teams and see if you need extra people or not to, to, to do the things. And those things, they need to be run as a normal project. Any modernization uh, initiative should run as a backlog, deliverables, milestones, uh, things moving from to do to, to in progress to done. So you cannot just have a bunch of people playing with stuff for God knows how long, right? It needs to be properly managed. So that's the summary of the, the kind of things that you need to have, you need to understand and do if you want to drive technical change, mainly on the modernization side. 
This is not easy. And, and that's the reason for my talk. We are good at in understanding code and technologies and Kubernetes and stuff like that. But driving change, uh, in order to drive change, we need to go beyond the technical knowledge. We need to understand what is the business value. And not only understand the business value, because we think that we might know that, but we need to be able to bring people along, right? So we need to be able to bring all those people in and create a, a, a strategy, a vision that everyone says, wow, yes, that would be awesome if you could do that. And, and you know what? According to what you've done here, it's actually possible. Maybe not the entire vision that you created, but there are quite certainly a few of those steps. They are possible. And that's, but, but for that, you need to have that breadth. Uh, if you don't have yourself, you need to have in this group, the group needs to have the breadth to do, to think about all those things and, and align. Uh, wrapping up, there is a, in, in larger organizations, we are working with a very, very large organization and they have a lot of things going on. Those are things to modernize. And what we are proposing, well, we are already doing, is what we call a continuous improvement program. So what you identify is all the different uh, initiative sources that we call, and those can be functional areas, can be like some, some, some source of technical debt, someone is somehow getting uh, technical debt from somewhere, uh, or they have ops or QA, or they have other uh, root cause analysis or uh, corrective actions, preventive actions, initiatives, there's a CAPA process. So all of those different areas from the business are sources, for improvements, right? they, they can seed or ask for improvements. And then you need a steering group that will funnel, that will take all that information and then create a business strategy and say, yeah, of course, it would be great to solve that. But compared to everything else, we will have a much bigger impact, a business impact here or there. And then they can prioritize that and then dish that out to the, the respective teams or they assemble specific teams for the program. So, so then they can organize the teams according to what they need to be done. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, like uh, what we want is to align the business and technology. So in a healthy environment, I would love to see the, 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 the business uh, creating their initiatives, their plans. They say like, oh, this is our business roadmap. That's what we'd like to achieve. And we can come in with the technology to build the, the foundation that is needed so the business can achieve their goals, right? So we plan together as the, the business is planning their business vision, we should join that with our technical vision and the two together uh, will create a very healthy uh, development uh, environment. So, of course, that, uh, I need to do some, uh, to talk about JetBrains. Uh, Cojunus is our JetBrains partner uh, and we've been using their tools for, I don't even remember for how long. And, and even before Cojunus, like I was using them, modernization implies dealing with a lot of very complex code and problems, but mainly code. And, 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 I, and it, this is not because I'm at get, get brains, but like uh, most of my projects are in the JVM, mainly in Java, and, and, and tackling very large code bases with bad tools is not possible. So having good tools uh, that can allow you refactoring and move things around a safe way can, can uh, can can give you the confidence to make those changes, and, and, and we're very happy to to advertise their products because it's not only because we're partners, but because we, we really think that their products are great. So that's it. That's what I had to share with you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sandro. Um, I loved that presentation. I I always love stuff which is like. Because I've worked at a lot of different places, I, I've always I always like presentations where it's like, right, how can we actually make the changes that um, that need to be made? Um, one one comment I have though, and this is a similar thing I have when I originally started reading stuff about agile, like way back when, um, XP things like that. It's, it is a little bit different, I think, when you're coming from the point of view of, of a consultant, because usually that means the organisation has recognised there's something wrong and something needs to change. Um, and I think that kind of helps because there's a certain level of, of buy-in that you get from from having been consulted in order to do this. I, I think I was kind of interested, is there a sort of pre-step that maybe developers could take to 
to get a bit more buy-in from the business? Do you know what I'm saying? Like before yeah, we get, yeah, the, get okay. the consultants in. So that's, that's why I was trying to share, because like what, what, what I shared here is kind of the work that we do. But this is what I realized later on in life. It's like there was nothing preventing me to do that before. So, for example, with those, those things, they, 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 because it's a presentation and the amount of information that, that I was sharing, uh, it seems that those things take a long time. For example, the business alignment can be done in a day, in a couple of days. If you if you really narrow down an area of your system, you can uh, you, instead of saying to, you, to 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 the business or to your sponsor, say like, "Oh, we need to change all that." It's like, do you have like half a day for in the next like a series of half days this week that we can go to a room? I, I have this plan. We know that things are not going so well. And that's what I would like to do, try to get that information, understand from your perspective what's not going so well, what would you like to improve? And then you do that with these groups. And start bringing them along in those conversations instead of just asking, oh, like, we should do this. No, you consult them, right? You start bringing them along. And this can be done by anyone. You don't need an external consultant. And to be very fair, uh, Tricia, what we do as consultants normally, when we go into a, a company, we, what we do, we listen to all those people, right? So we are almost a psychologist, a psychologist at the beginning. We, we just put all those people together and start listening to them. And then all of a sudden, we start saying things, just repeating what someone in that organization has been saying or has been saying for five years, and no one listens. But it's not because no one listens, but also maybe the approach was also not quite right. So those things can be done by a dev with the product owner, with the QA together, gradually bringing some of the stakeholders to some of those meetings and gradually creating that plan together, involving people gradually. That's great. That's really helpful. And, and I can see that you've kind of, you've inspired a bunch of people too, because we've got a few questions like, um, where can we learn more about how to become a change driver? Do you have a book or a course? Someone else said, you do have a book about this, right? <laughs> uh, I, I've been trying to write one for quite a long time now, <laughs> and I keep stopping it. Uh, I, I have something on the go, uh, but it's been, I just need to sit down and finish it, but well, we are, uh, I, I am working on it, but we are also releasing quite a lot of uh, materials on the Codulance website. We, we, there is an area now on software modernization, and we are constantly adding new uh, articles and videos and stuff, but, but we, we will have more things uh, hopefully in the near future. Um, a couple of comments and these questions came in early on in the talk um, about uh, sort of timing so um, one is shouldn't we try to put maintainability and modernization as part of the software strategy from the beginning I, I would have thought the answer is yes of course <laughs> it, it depends on what, what you, you you maintainability certainly right so if the beginning you mean you are starting you are building a new system now then certainly, then there's no need to modernize. So what you build into is the maintainability that the person said. If you build a good way of maintaining the system and monitoring the system and a good modularization, then you just need that, what I mentioned at the beginning, the normal maintenance of the system, but you don't need a full-blown modernization initiative. It's just that the normal maintenance would be enough. Yeah, and, and that's kind of leads on to the other point, which is what should be the relation between adding new features, fixing bugs, and software modernization? So the, I think that I wouldn't say that, that I wouldn't talk from this perspective. I, I, I would talk more in terms of do we feel that we are struggling to build new features? Do we feel that we are constantly having too many bugs, either during the QA phase, if you have one, or you are getting production? At some point in the process, we are finding too many bugs. So if the answer is yes to those questions, and then you start going at the root cause of, of why we are taking so long, why we are having those bugs, then maybe you, you understand that if you modernize a few areas of your system, and that means re-architecting, redesigning, refactoring, uh, uh, so would potentially solve those problems, right? 
Um, do you have any template for giving the value versus cost, return on investment or break even point? Not necessarily like that, very specific, because this would be quite difficult to do because different types of modernization initiatives will provide you a different type of benefit, right? So, and the way to calculate that can vary significantly. But we do have in our website, in the, in the modernization uh, page, there are some publications in there, and there is a, a very long article, very comprehensive article in how to make a business case for modernization. So you probably will find quite a, a lot of uh, interesting information in there. I think that ties into a bunch of the other questions. A lot of the questions are are basically uh, what you'd expect, like how do I how do I sell it to the product owner? How do I, you know, how do I get the business on board? And it sounds like you you have material like that for the on the website. Yeah, uh, but again, they start from understanding what they need instead of what you think they need. Um, I think we've probably got time for a couple more, maybe. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's all it's all part of the same thing. Like, this is a difficult problem. How do yeah. we sell people? Um, any guidance or tips to convince my organization to modernize software development? I mean, that's a quite general question, but yeah. So th this comes back to those two first. Uh, mainly, the, the first one there is the business alignment, right? So again, you if you already have a predefined conception of your problems and the potential solution and alignment for you is convincing them about that, the chance for you to fail is quite big. What we do, uh, and, and I mean like, uh, as a consultant doesn't mean someone that works for a consultancy, everyone is a consultant, right? So everyone is selling their services. So, so you can be a consultant within your organization. So basically what you need to do is, you don't sell, you don't bring them on board selling your ideas. You, you before you ask their feedback, I'm right? like, what would you wish to improve? Where do you think that we are not doing so well? It start from there, because when you go to with a proposal, you need to make sure that you are addressing those things, or even if they have a misconception, because this also happens, they, they, they say that they, they, they identify something as a problem, and you think that there is a misconception, that's another area that you need to work to, to, to fix that misconception. This is really great. Um, we are out of time for any more questions, um, but I'm sure that people can get hold of you on Twitter or um, through various other media. Yeah. At Sandro Mancuso on Twitter or Sandro at Codjunas.com uh, as an email, you will find me. Great. Thank you so much, Sandro. Thank you, Trish. Good to see you again.